Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last March, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person at 6300 A Street or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of the faith that we share. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place for it. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In this time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? In our 150th year as a congregation, who are we and what are we doing? This is, as Res Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. She also says this is no time to go in alone. And this, right now, right here, is where we practice that. So take a moment as we begin the service this morning. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here this morning. Set aside what will come later. Be right here. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. This morning's chalice lighting is the poem in praise of praise by the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. Yes, even now, when so much is broken, praise tears that will not be held back, witness to the immeasurable beauty of the smile of a six-year-old gunned down by those who praise nothing. Yes, even now, when so much is at risk, praise the blood that pulses its systole and diastole rhythm, dancing to and from the heart, even when the sky is smoke and our masks have become an ordinary necessity. Yes, even now, when so much is struggle, praise bodies that sweat and tremble, muscles tense with embodied comprehension, that we are headed the wrong way and the irresistible urge to change direction, a glorious, clumsy, prodigal return. Yes, especially now, when so much is at stake. Praise something, anything, so alive and extravagant that it awakens and calls you to discard despair, abandon apathy, and praise whatever brings you back to life.
Our story today is called Of Thee I Sing, and it's by Barack Obama. A letter to my daughters. Have I told you how wonderful you are, how the sound of your feet running from afar brings dancing rhythms to my day, how you laugh and sunshine spills into the room? Have I told you that you are creative? A woman named Georgia O'Keeffe moved to the desert and painted petals, bone, bark. She helped us see big beauty in what is small, the hardness of stone and the softness of feather. Have I told you that you are smart? That you braid great ideas with imagination? A man named Albert Einstein turned pictures in his mind into giant advances in science, changing the world with energy and light. Have I told you that you are brave? A man named Jackie Robinson played baseball and showed us all how to turn fear to respect and respect to love. He swung his bat with the grace and strength of a lion and gave brave dreams to other dreamers. Have I told you that you are a healer? Sitting Bull was a Sioux medicine man who healed broken hearts and broken promises. It is fine that we are different, he said. For peace, it is not necessary for eagles to be crows. Though he was put in prison, his spirit soared free on the plains and his wisdom touched the generations. Have I told you that you have your own song? A woman named Billie Holiday wore a gardenia in her hair and sang beautiful blues to the world. Her voice, full of sadness and joy, made people feel deeply and add their melodies to the chorus. Have I told you that you are strong? A woman named Helen Keller fought her way through long, silent darkness. Though she could not see or hear, she taught us to look at and listen to each other. Never waiting for life to get easier, she gave others courage to face their challenges. Have I told you how important it is to honor other sacrifices? A woman named Maya Lin designed the Vietnam Veterans Memorial to remember those who gave their lives in the war and the Civil Rights Memorial to thank the many who fought for equality. Public spaces should be filled with art, she thought, so that we can walk amidst it, recalling the past and inspired to fix the future. Have I told you that you are kind? A woman named Jane Addams fed the poor and helped them find jobs. She opened doors and gave people hope. She taught adults and invited children to play and laugh and let their spirits grow wide. Have I told you that you don't give up? When violence erupted in our nation, a man named Martin Luther King Jr. taught us unyielding compassion. He gave us a dream that all races and creeds could walk hand in hand. He marched and he prayed and one at a time opened hearts and saw the birth of his dream in us. Have I told you that you are an explorer. A man named Cesar Chavez showed farm workers their own power when they felt they had none. The people were poor but worked hard and loved the land. Caesar picketed, prayed, and talked. The people listened to their hearts and marched for their rights. Si sí, se puede, Caesar said. Yes, you can. Have I told you that you are part of a family? A man named Abraham Lincoln knew that all of America should work together. He kept our nation one and promised freedom to enslaved sisters and brothers. This man of the people, simple and plain, asked more of our country that we behave as kin. Have I told you to be proud to be an American? Our first president, George Washington, believed in liberty and justice for all. His barefoot soldiers crossed wintry rivers, forging ever on. He helped make an idea into a new country, strong and true, a country of principles, a country of citizens. Have I told you that America is made up of people of every kind? People of all races, religions, and beliefs. People from the coastlines and the mountains. People who have made bright lights shine by sharing their unique gifts and giving us the courage to lift one another up to keep up the fight, to work, and build upon all that is good in our nation. Have I told you that they are all a part of you? Have I told you that you are one of them and that you are the future? Have I told you that I love you? And that is the end of our story.
Good morning. I'm Dorothy Ramsey, and I'm the Pledge Drive Chair for the 2021 budget year. We're almost to the finish line for the Pledge Drive, and I want to send out a huge, huge thank you to those who've responded in the first three weeks. We've got until October 31 to record pledges and prepare the documents for the board's review. This is our last Pledge Drive testimonial message. So just as a reminder, if you haven't responded to the Pledge Drive, your pledge from this year will automatically roll over to next year. And that's fine, but we do anticipate some lost income from loss of rentals such as Ollie because the building is closed. So if you can increase your pledge by even just a little bit, it would be helpful. We're not planning to increase the budget, the expense side of the budget, but we do know that some of the income we budgeted for can't be fully anticipated in 2021. If you haven't already pledged, please consider, consider doing so. Thank you again for all you do for this beloved community. Hi. Welcome to another fireside chat given by our 150th anniversary committee. It's glad, I'm glad to be with you. My name is Frank Adler and I'm talking briefly about the history and significance of Arthur Weatherly's first ministry from 1908 to 1919. Uh, I'll speak at a later time on his second ministry from 1929 to 1942. He saw religion and democracy not just joined at the hip, but even more intimately connected. In fact, he saw democracy as the social expression of the religious affirmation of the worth and value of the individual soul. He had a deep affinity for the working class, and he loved to play pool. <laughs> he also loved philosophical discussions. He once said that a liberal church needed to satisfy three functions. One, it must contribute something to the enrichment of the lives of its members, children and adults. Two, it must loyally stand by the principle of a free pulpit, meaning that the minister must be a man, not a puppet. And three, it must encourage its members to identify themselves by thought or deed and whenever possible by both with movements of the communal life. After the death of Weatherly's friend, Jenkins Lloyd-Jones in 1918, John Morris Evans, minister of the First Unitarian Church of Dayton, Ohio, accepted the call to be Lloyd's successor in Chicago. In September of 1919, Weatherly accepted a call to go to the church in Dayton to succeed Evans. The entire story of why he left Lincoln is still unclear to me. One thing, however, is clear. He left very reluctantly because Lincoln was near and dear to his heart. Another thing is clear, too. After leaving Lincoln, he will continue to fight against racial injustice and white supremacy. Indeed, the cornerstone of his second ministry will be to help establish an African-American community center as a home for black self-expression in Lincoln. Thank you. Thank you to Frank Edler and the whole 150th anniversary committee for the work that you've done and continue to do in telling the story of this place. Frank's whole uh, talk on Arthur we Weatherly is available on our YouTube page um, streaming. We'll try and link it uh, in the description or in the comments of this, um, this worship video. Um, and, uh, and we look forward to the, the second half of it where he'll discuss Weatherly's second ministry here in Lincoln. Each week, as part of our service, we set aside time to mark the joys and sorrows in our lives. 
We do this because we are a community, because what matters to one of us matters to all of us, because we know that we are tied in an interconnected web of destiny. And so, while we're in this space on YouTube, we do it this way. We play a piece of music, and while that piece of music is playing, if you're holding yourself or someone else in either joy or sorrow, type that name in the chat box running right next to the video. As the song plays, we will hold each other in joy and in sorrow, recognizing that we are a single community. Thank you for your presence. One of the real joys of ministry in the midst of this pandemic has been the, the collapse of geographic barriers in ministry. Our guest preacher this morning is the Reverend Fred Wooden, uh, who I have long admired uh, and rarely had a chance to interact with in person. Fred is the, the longtime minister of Fountain Street Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, who now serves uh, in Arizona as an interim. Um, Fred is also from Baltimore. He and I share a connection to First Unitarian, um, and we had a chance to catch up this week, uh, which you can see on the daily updates that have been playing. But the treat for this morning is that Fred Wooden uh, will preach with us. Um, and, uh, and without further ado, uh, I, will, I will hand it off here to Fred. So I want to go to my theme this morning, and I'll be using a text here, so if you see me move my head, it's because I have to look at it, uh, called Waking Up from the American Dream, and I'm using dream in multiple ways today. I actually first spoke on this same theme four years ago, or just about this time before the election, but it seems to be just as pertinent now as it was then, uh, but the story actually begins almost 20 years ago. Uh, at that time, I lived in Brooklyn Heights in Brooklyn, New York, serving the First Unitarian Congregational Society there. And we lived on a seventh floor apartment that belonged to the church. Uh, it was a lovely place to be with uh, plenty of windows and some of them even looking over toward the big city. And most mornings, and uh, this one was one of those mornings I would go to the gym and I'd come back and while I was still in my gym clothes, I'd sit down and start typing on my computer to get work done. Now, New York City is a very busy and noisy place, but I heard a sound, a loud sound, and I thought, well, <clears throat> maybe they're having a problem with the construction site where they're building a new courthouse. But then I heard some uh, voices and loud steps and people running and, uh, well, as you might have guessed, this was September 11th, 2001. And from the window, we could see the smoke coming from the Twin Towers. 
My wife soon came home after that, and we both watched on TV, listening for news, and we both realized we had to change our day, and I hurried into the shower to clean up so I could go to work, although what we could do, I wasn't quite sure. No one knew. At any rate, while I was toweling off, the first tower fell, which I knew because my wife made a loud noise, almost a shout and a groan, and then on the way to the church building, the second tower fell, and all the dust came over our neighborhood and fell down in a kind of macabre sticker tape parade. And I mention this now because, first of all, it was in September, and we are now in early October, and we still remember it vividly, but also because five years later, the editor of the UU World, Tom Stites, asked me to write an article to reflect on things five years hence. And it seems to me it's just as pertinent now what I wrote, that is, as what I wrote then. And I'm going to quote from my article. At the time, I said, after 9-11, the structures we have occupied intellectually and spiritually as a nation crumbled. Much of what we believed about our country, our ourselves, about the world around us, seem to be untrue, but we have not acknowledged that. We act as though the structures remain intact, enthralled by them still. Now, I use that term enthralled for a reason, because it came out of a letter that Abraham Lincoln wrote to Congress in the fall of 1862 to prepare them for the Emancipation Proclamation. And in that letter, he wrote, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. Let that sink in. The occasion is piled high with difficulty, and we must rise with the occasion. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. I think his analysis then was accurate for his time, but also for subsequent times. Franklin Roosevelt's election and promises was, a, was another moment when he said that the dogmas of the quiet past were inadequate to the present, that they had to think anew and act anew before they could disenthrall themselves and save the country. And I think the same thing happened in 2001, except that we didn't get that leadership. Sorry, we just didn't. We are still enthralled to the world that we thought existed and in some ways did exist before 2001. And here we are, 2020, on the eve of an election that is profoundly about what we are as a nation. We are enthralled by what we think America is, which is more dream than reality. In my opinion, since then, since September 11, 2001, we have taken refuge even further into a, a fantasy dream of America, of being the greatest nation the world has ever seen, so much so that casting any doubt on that is greeted with withering contempt by our current president and someone who promises to restore us back to a state that we thought existed, but never really existed entirely. And that is how we are enthralled. And we have to disenthrall ourselves. We have to wake up from this version of the American dream. Now, as I mentioned, this is not a new experience. We were here in the years leading up to the Civil War, when we would rather pay the wages of slavery than to avoid the war itself. We were here, as I said, for the Great Depression and at other places in between. Roughly every two or three generations, we come to a point where where we think we are as a nation and where we actually are, are no longer compatible. And we, and we have to choose between one or the other. The dissonance is too great to ignore. And each and every time, we have been tempted to go back to the dream rather than face reality. To be fair, 
at its best, there is an American dream that it does make us aspire for something more than the present. But just as often, we use the dream to assuage us that things aren't as bad as we think or someone else thinks. Ask people what the American dream is sometime, and you'll get iterations. They all overlap. There is the land of opportunity, which drew so many from so many corners of the world, hoping for more opportunity than they could find in Europe or Asia. There were those who believed that the American dream was being able to own your own home at a time when landlords were brutal and having that security was important. And there are those who simply say the American dream is freedom, whatever that means, and it means so many things to so many different people. In each of those cases, we said them without thinking about what they meant and what they entailed and whether they were actually true for everyone or just for some. The American dream, as I've just described it, is not a dream of the future at all. It is a, a sense of what we think America is. And in that respect, it's a dream like a sleeping dream, meaning one that you have to be asleep to believe in, as the comedian George Carlin put it. And we have done a lot of sleeping in our history. Before the Civil War, as I mentioned, in the Roaring Twenties, during the Civil Rights Era in Vietnam. Sometimes, though, voices will be raised and they'll get just enough attention that we uh, were annoyed by them. They come from people from the past like Frederick Douglass or Susan B. Anthony or later James Baldwin and Betty Friedan. These are people who tell us facts we would rather not hear because they, they, they threaten the complacency we have about our state and the world. One of the most recent voices on this front has been Ta-Nehisi Coates, who in his startling book, Between the World and Me, wrote this. I have seen the world all, seen the dream all my life. It is perfect houses with nice lawns. It is Memorial Day cookouts and block associations and driveways. The dream is tree houses and Cub Scouts. The dream smells like peppermint and tastes like strawberry shortcake. You can almost hear the irony that he's going to be unloading in just a moment. And he does continue. And for so long, he says, I wanted to escape into the dream, to fold my country over my head like a, like a blanket. But this has never been an option because the dream rests on our backs, the bedding made from our bodies. He's referring to people of color, especially African Americans, that the dream that he just articulated depends upon structures that have exploited people of color well as long as the nation has been around. That's the version of the dream that is not hope, but illusion, the escape into something rather than a hope for something. He and all those voices that are not straight or white or male or Christian are telling us that the American dream, as I just described it, as he just described it, of universal suburban contentment is actually a way of avoiding the pain of the past that afflicts everyone, not just those who paid for it directly. James Baldwin saw this over half a century ago when he wrote, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once the hate is gone, they will, have, they will be forced to deal with pain. If that strikes a nerve, good, because it struck me. The American dream, as I've 
articulated it as Tana Hizzy Coates described it, is the opiate of the masses, to borrow that phrase from Karl Marx, not merely a, a drug that fogs the mind, but one that dulls the pain. We forget that opium in the 19th century was a painkiller. And we are as addicted to that opiate as any true drug addict. And the cost of that drug out of sight for most of us has come in the form of redlining, reservations for natives, internments for Japanese Americans, ghettos for others. It is schools that educate only a few, jails that house too many, environmental pollution that afflicts some more than others, and almost everything else we consider a problem. Virtually every issue we face as a nation comes from allowing the dream to displace reality, to preferring the drugged sleep of denial to the pain of reality. And what can we do to blame them? Who wants to face the pain? And yet we know if we have an illness, if we have torn a muscle, if we pinched a nerve, just taking the drug doesn't make it go away. It simply masks the injury. Okay, okay, having made this case a little bit, what can I do? What can you do? What can we do in a nation where denial has become policy and hate? is the currency we all exchange with each other as we approach this election. A member of my previous church here in Grand Rapids, after the election, uh, gave me a book by Parker Palmer, the Quaker educator. It was called Healing the Heart of Democracy, and he perceived then where we are now and even more. And he wrote, I began to wonder about my own ability to reach across the divides that threaten the union today. What do I have in common with people who, for example, feel no need to, to listen to anyone who sees anything differently? He then wonders, perhaps we share an abiding grief. Grief is a kind of pain, isn't it? Yes, that was, that was true. Maybe the pain that our nation carries is the grief for all the losses we have borne and inflicted upon ourselves. And in that respect, no matter how fervently I was liberal, I was no more awake than others who regarded me as terribly wrong. Behind the cynicism, the defensiveness, the contempt, the I'm right, you're wrong thinking is a common even universal sorrow about something we've lost, something we've done that we would prefer not to face. Now, I'm a clergyman, I know about grief. I've walked with hundreds as they went through it with their families. I've walked through it myself, first with my grandparents, my parents, and even two infant children of our own. Grief really is universal and always includes those famous feelings we heard about years ago of denial, anger, depression, sadness. These are not just personal things. We can see them in the nation right now. Maybe one reason we are so unhappy is because we have not dealt with the grief from September 11th. But of course, we have not dealt with the grief of Vietnam, of civil rights, of World War II, which, however righteous, still cost millions of lives, of the Depression, of the First World War, of the labor struggles of the beginning of the 20th century, of Reconstruction abandoned, of a civil war that demolished a tenth of our population. Maybe we are so angry now because because we have not believed, accepted, and dealt with all that pain and loss. Instead, we've tried to avoid it by pressing on, 
by trying harder, by doing more. We have all taken the tranquilizing drug of denial and the stimulating drug of anger. Now, our nation is really bad at emotions like pain and loss and grief. And I get it. I understand why. Those feelings make us feel weak and confused and ashamed. No one likes that. We also know that when you refuse to accept those emotions by pretending, by denying and raging, they don't go away. They get harder and harder to deny. So we step up the grief. We step up the pretending. We step up the denial. We step up the rage. That's why anger out of loss and pain never ends. It only grows and looks for more to be angry at. That's why we have fear that the anger will eventually consume us. A lot of folks in churches like ours dislike our current president because we know he's exploiting the old, illusory, opiated dream of promising to make America great again. But he's not the problem. No. Our problem belongs to us. He is no more the problem than the drug that swages the pain is the problem. It's the pain that's the problem. When a nation is so divided as we are, so hostile among ourselves as we are, you can be sure we're all feeling the same emotions, but we're evading them and evading them with our own excuses. Think of a couple. I think we all know at least one couple where one is mean and abusive and the other is alcoholic, for example. Each blames the other for their current condition. If he weren't alcohol, she weren't alcoholic, I, I wouldn't be abusive. If he weren't abusive, I wouldn't have to drink. But we all know there's something before that that set it off. Something that can't be said yet because it's too terrifying. Maybe it was the loss of a child and marital infidelity, the loss of a job, a bankruptcy, family that got in the way of their marriage, whatever it is, that is what the abuse and the alcoholism cover up. Now I want to go back to Parker Palmer because we have to get to what we can do about this. Palmer says that the only way to get past this is to go through this. There's no evading it. Every good therapist will tell you the same thing. And that means waking up, waking up from the opiate dream of those suburbs Tana Hezzy Coates talked about to deal with the reality of all that has been lost and all that has been harmed. In some ways, that's always what woke meant a few years ago. But of course, in that moment, some people say, oh, that's so politically correct because they didn't want to wake up. And of course, it turned into a cliche, and then we stopped saying it altogether. So let's go back to an earlier version of this, to a, an ethicist in America over 50 years ago, Reinhold Niebuhr, who wrote, human existence is precarious and will remain so to the end of history. In this precarious situation, the only chance of survival lies in a modest recognition in our weaknesses. See where he's going? Until we can see that we are not as strong as we think we are, till we can give up that illusion, we're stuck. And that applies to everyone, not just those over there, those right here, me. Theologians call this sin. That is that we are all imperfect, fragmentary creatures, that we can't do everything right. And even when we do some things right, we're not doing them as right as we should. Everyone can be deluded, foolish, and cruel, whether they're liberal and woke or conservative and making America great again. Everyone. And I speak from experience. 
After 40 years of clergy life, studying, trying, I still try to hide my mistakes. I still try to bluff around my failures. Everyone does. And how well has that worked in the long run? Never will. What this pain can teach, this grief can teach, is that if we have the nerve to accept it, we have found a source of strength that we did not know we had. In order to find that strength, though, we have to risk being weak. That is to say, we have to do what Reinhold Niebuhr says. We have to risk humility. Niebuhr adds, if ever a nation required the spirit of genuine contrition and humility, it is ours. Wow. Is he not right? And he's a good Christian. He wrote that during the very era the president says we want to go back to when we were great again. Reinhold Niebuhr saw through the pretense even then. Our national soul is hurting. There is no question. From the unacknowledged grief of the losses we have suffered and also the pain we have inflicted and borne. This is true for everyone, but it has been especially true for the enslaved, the native, the different, the merely poor. That grief is so old and deep that we have automatically numbed ourselves into a slumber of denial for most of the last two and a half centuries. If we think we can sleep through it forever, though, we are wrong. Our only future involves waking up, feeling it, and dealing with it. But there is reason to hope. I told you there was reason to hope. I believe communities like ours, religious communities, spiritual communities, ours, but everyone, remember, Reinhold Niebuhr was an evangelical Christian, are uniquely empowered to walk this road and lead us as a nation through it, to show that confession and contrition, that weakness really is the path to genuine strength and greatness. Every religion I know teaches that we cannot escape our pain by denying it. We have to take responsibility, that the path to greatness begins with humility, with abandoning the idea of being great in order to become more than we are right now. Contemporary biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann summarizes my whole sermon in one sentence, and that's why I didn't tell you the sentence at the beginning, because then this would be over by now. He wrote, speaking to his community as a Christian, the prophetic tasks of the church are to speak the truth in a society that lives in illusion grieve in a society that practices denial and express hope in a society that lives in despair. That applies to every house of worship, not just Christians. So we have three jobs to do. To speak the truth. Not the truth that we know that other people don't, but the truth that we all need to know. And one of those truths is that we have to deal with the grief and loss and pain and shame that has accumulated for so many years. It begins with that. We Unitarian Universalists, we love being the righteous prophet, but maybe this time we need to be different. Maybe we are the ones who need to listen to the prophet, not be the prophet, because we stand in need of humbling as much as anyone else, and whenever we play the prophet, we get to pretend we're the good guys. We're not the good guys. We're just people. Only those who have known pain and grief and loss and shame and regret can show the way through it. You cannot wag your finger at the guilty and expect them to believe you. Those who have borne it, though, can show the way. For over 35 years, a community of Alcoholics Anonymous met in my previous church in Grand Rapids. 
They probably have been there longer than any other group. And their philosophy is one we should look at very carefully. It is the company of the fallen that gives us strength, not the army of the righteous that shows us the way. We have to ask, how have we fallen? How have we stumbled? In what way have we, the woke, the liberal, not done our bit? Because we have not dealt with our responsibility and our sins. I think there is a real American dream. It does exist. It exists in small ways in those first words written 200 and some years ago, refined by grief and loss and war. It just appears in poets and prophets across our history and down to our own day. And it is still waiting to come true. And it is simply five words that a, a Baptist minister wrote a hundred and some years ago. Liberty and justice for all. That's it. That's what we want. Liberty and justice for all. Far from lost, it is something we can yet do. And if we do that, all the other stuff will happen too. The prosperity, the safety, the acceptance, the equality. But we have to rouse ourselves from the false dream of our own righteousness, of our own goodness, of our own adequacy, and arouse ourselves to the real pain of shared sins, and shared grief, and shared loss. If we do this, we truly could be a great nation. And that's where the hope lies. Hope. And we, communities like ours, can be midwives to that hope. We really can, and that might be our mission. My prayer is that we, as a movement, find the courage to try the path of humility and contrition, to show the way to others that this is the path toward strength and greatness, the greatness that is still waiting for us if we have the courage. Thank you for letting me join you this morning. Take good care and amen. Each week we take up an uh, offering to support the work of the congregation and its programs in the world and its partners in the world. We'll do that in just a moment. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to give via text to the church. The number will be just below me on this screen. I do want to take a moment to, uh, to say and, and to remind you that October is the month where we do our pledge drive. Um, we heard earlier a pledge testimonial um, about, uh, about what the church means to our members. And it falls to me at this point to say that we have one more week in our pledge drive. We run it through the month of October. Currently, um, we have about 60 pledges that have come in, and we have 240 people that pledged last year. So um, while it's, it's normal to wait till the end of the month uh, to send in your pledge, please, please do it, because in the next month we need to put together a budget, and the only way we can do that well uh, is when we have a clear sense of, of what our pledge income is going to be in the next year. Um, I will say it has been remarkable to watch the pledges that come in uh, and and some of the uh, additions that people have been able to do um, in the first in the first wave of pledges that we've received. Thank you so much for your generosity, for your support of this place, uh, whether through the offering on Sunday morning or through volunteer hours during the week uh, or through pledging. The, car the congregation runs because of its members. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Our hymn of love to play.
pledge ourselves anew to that high cause of greater understanding of who we are and what in us is This chalice extinguishing will be a little metaphorical this morning. Uh, there is an outtake um, that maybe we'll show someday uh, where the, the chalice behind me sets off the smoke alarm in our house, so it is not currently lit. But uh, if you have a chalice at home, uh, or if you have a chalice in your mind, um, we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of love, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. Be at peace, beloveds, and amen. I'll see you in the daily updates and on Thursday night. <laughs>